Hey, man. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go first and introduce yeah. you. This custom. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Kenji Lopez Alt. Um, I am um, the current chief. You, what are you, man? You're culinary like the, consultant. You're the chief culinary <laughs> consultant now. At Serious Eats. Um, I've been a number of physicians at Serious Eats. Um, I've worked with Ed for many years. Um, Ed was the last boss I ever had, and he, <laughs> he will be the last boss I ever had, um, which, I, which I hope makes him proud. He, he once told me that um, <laughs> he said that he vowed when, after he left his last job that he would never have another boss, and then he said, you're the closest thing I I can come to not having a boss. <laughs> um, anyhow, that's me, and um, this this is Ed. Um, Ed is the um, well, he's the the producer of of jazz albums, and he is uh, a missionary of the delicious. He's the founder of Serious Eats. Um, he is um, well, and now he's the author of Serious Eater. Um, and so, yes, please welcome Ed Levine. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it, man. I ho uh, hope we, we, we prove ourselves worthy of that introduction. There's some heavy hitters that can come here. <laughs> um, so I want to, I guess, first ask you, um, and this is a question you ask all of your podcast guests, um, but what was, um, and, and I'm assuming that everybody here is here because they know who Ed is, so we don't have to go into too many details about what Serious Eats is or anything, but um, what was uh, life like at the Levine table growing up? Well, I, I like to say that it was like being at Speaker's Corner at Hyde Park in London because you really had to sing for your supper because everybody had a lot of opinions. I was one of four brothers. I'm the youngest. And uh, my dad and mom met at uh, a Communist Party uh, had a Communist Party meeting at City College of New York, so we were all red diaper babies, as they're called, the children of communists. And so there was a fervor, like everyone had really strong opinions. And so it was just like one of those things. It was like being plugged into an electric sock. There was nothing tranquil about life at the Levine family <laughs> table. <laughs> you know? And so... Um, Sounds nothing like working for you. <laughs> no, exactly. No, you should ask my wife. There's nothing tranquil about me. But um, so it was... The food was secondary to the to 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 the arguing, basically. You know, everyone we argued a lot, and um, and and it was the ability to have a point of view and articulate it and defend it well mm -hmm. that really counted. No matter what the subject. Yeah, no matter what the subject was, and my oldest brother, who is a main character in the book, Mike, uh, you know, developed sort of libertarian, contrarian views. And so he and my dad used to go at it tooth and nail, you know, and um, and the food was secondary, right? No, and so, so what, I mean, for you, when did, when did the, um, when did the food become so the, the, yeah, non-secondary? Yeah, the food became non-secondary really with, with uh, my paternal grandmother, Ida, who um, we would pick up every Sunday uh, at at the we lived right across the Queens line in on Long Island, and we would go to the last subway stop in Queens on the E train, and we would pick her up, and she would just cook up a storm, like all day, matzo brai and French fries, like thick cut French fries with a little bit of onion in the oil, and latkes, double and fried or ma yeah, double yeah, well sort of yeah, that's a good question, Kenji. I wish you were around back then. <laughs> um, but so that was where the first time I sort of equated food with love, you know, was like. Because my mother thought cooking was a counter-revolutionary act. My mother was a, <laughs> you know, my mother was a feminist. She wrote a local column for the South Shore Record, which was the local newspaper about progressive child rearing techniques. And in my case, it was ignoring. That was the progressive <laughs> child rearing technique. And, um, 
And she actually wrote a piece about how women should re-enter the workforce after their kids are old enough. Um, two years before Betty Friedan wrote The Feminine Mystique. So um, it was just, you know, that, that was the, my grandmother though was the person who like, wow, food is this really wonderful thing. And, and once I started being old enough to ride around on my bike, I'd start, I don't know, I, was, I don't even know how this came to be, but all of a sudden, like, I'd, I'd, I'd assemble my own bologna sandwiches and I'd go to uh, one store for the bologna because the bologna was better there. Right. I was right, like right. 10, and then I would go to another what, store. What made it better? Um, I don't know, because bologna is... to order? Yeah, slice to order for sure. Sawdust on the floor. Sawdust on the floor. And then I'd go to the local grocery store where they would have a fresh Kaiser roll because they were better than the rolls you could get at the butcher. Right, right, right. And so, and then I would... you'd go home and make your own mayonnaise. Yeah. (laughs) That wasn't until I met you. (laughs) Um, And so that's that's how the food thing started. But I didn't... You know, I didn't, it was, you know, I I say in the book that the first 12 years of my life was a joyful blur because I was sort of left alone to pursue my own passions, which Mm -hmm. were food and sports. And, you know, I could participate in the political discussion. And I was reading the Times from cover to cover. We got three newspapers every day. So, you know, politics and current events were always on the agenda. And and you were taught to defend your your opinion absolutely and and it never occurred you know my dad worked for um my uncle quite unhappily right he he uh wanted to be a teacher uh i maybe because of his party membership which he retained at least through the 50s and it's not clear uh if he ever stopped but um he couldn't get a job teaching, so uh, when they moved to Long Island, he took a job working for my uncle. And But the thing was, is that um, he was a terrible business person, you know? And uh, I think one of the things that I learned is um, you, it's really hard to have a boss. Like, mm-hmm. none of my brothers have bosses. And it's, it's interesting that, and I think it comes from that. It came from the fact that my father worked unhappily for um, his brother-in-law. And so it's like, mm, this is no way to roll. And I think that was the origins of me being the world's worst employee. <laughs> I, I am a terrible, terrible employee. I don't suffer fools well. My son says I have the worst poker face in the history of mankind, person kind, excuse me. And <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, that all started back then. And it, those first 12 years were, were a joyful blur. Uh, the first 12 years of yeah. Seuss. Seuss. So, no, the yeah. first 12 years of my life. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, and then what changed? And what are the parallels between your early life and the first, <laughs> and the first twelve well, years of serious? It's, it's interesting because um, right after those first twelve years, my dad got sick and died, and then two years later, my mom got sick. And um, I think what I took away from those pretty calamitous years was you could either crawl into a ball and go into a closet and not come out, or you could just figure out a way to put one foot in front of the other until you were ready to deal with what happened. And so, you know, it, 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 it sort of, I was, it, it wired me to both be resilient and also, the first 12 years before all that happened, um, I, w- I became a natural optimist. Like, my default mode was optimist, not, you know, whoa, what happened to me? And I think that's all that translated to Serious Eats and everything that transpired at Serious Eats. Like, <laughs> it all harkens back to those years. I, and that's why I put those chapters in the book. 
I did want all of you to feel sorry for me, but <laughs> um, it was more that it was, they were directly related to what happened at Syria Seeds, right. you know, so. So, so tell, me, I mean, tell me where you were, like, bef right before Serious Heats So I had, you know, after I graduated from college, um, where I had produced concerts, and, and I went to Grinnell College in Iowa, a small school, and the great what thing about... What kind of concerts? What? What kind of concerts? Oh, all kinds of concerts. Everything from Bruce Springsteen. We had the Jackson Five as a local band from Gary, Indiana, with Michael Jackson was 10 years old. Um, and it was great. And so I came to New York, but I was turned on to jazz by Gary Giddens, who became the jazz critic of the Village Voice. And then I came to New York too, of course, because I'm a missionary, right? I'm a Levine. That's what we do. We get up on soapboxes. And so I came to New York. And tell everyone about Michael Jackson. What? To tell everyone about Michael to Jackson. To tell everyone about Michael Jackson, first and foremost. And to save the jazz world. And there was that, there, I had this moment, and we have a filmmaker friend who talks about showing up at the Port Authority bus terminal where he, when he arrived in New York the very first time. And he said to himself, why didn't anybody tell me about this place before? And I sort of felt the same way. It was like New York was just an amazing place full of unbelievable music. I could go hear Sonny Rollins three times in the same week at the Village Vanguard, and he was my hero. And then I could stop at the Second Avenue Deli for a corned beef sandwich on the way. So it's kind of a perfect place for me. <laughs> and then the trifecta was meeting my wife. Uh, Vicky, who's here tonight, and who's obviously in the in the uh, in the book, and I met her at a party after a concert because I worked for this concert production firm, and we actually produced a Sonny Rollins concert. Uh, the night I met her, I came to the party because I heard they were serving homemade ice cream. <laughs> it was really good. Um, I think it was strawberry. And, you know, really good strawberry ice cream, you know, where the strawberries aren't frozen. Yeah, I yeah, hate yeah. that, man. I hate that. I, I like them when they're a little frozen around the edges. It's yeah, little, exactly. Little crunchy but then they get soft yeah, yeah. As, as they move towards the center. See, this is why we can work together. <laughs> <laughs> we agree about strawberry ice cream, a lot of other things. Not everything. But, um, and so I, I met Vicky, and she was actually meant for my roommate, and I just had never met anyone like her. You know, she was beautiful and smart and articulate, and and she laughed at my jokes. That was what was really important. You know, <laughs> is that she laughed at my jokes. What about your roommate? And my roommate, even though he was already going out with his future wife, like he he kept blocking her access to me. And finally, the woman who hosted the dinner party said, "Enough with this. You know, let Ed." call Vicky, and so uh, the rest is history. We've been married for a very, very long time, and, and so that completed the New York trifecta. It was like the air was pregnant with possibility for food, for music, and for love, so that's kind of a, a, the holy trinity as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that, so that was when you moved to New York, but then Right before you started, like, can you explain sure. to me why? Um, yeah, why? You yeah, so I eventually, um, I was in the music business. The club I was booking was sold. I produced a couple of Dr. John Solo records, which you should all buy. Not, and may he rest in peace, Mac. Recently passed away. You know uh, what? Recently passed away. Yeah, recently passed away at seventy-seven. How he made it to seventy-seven, I'll never know. <laughs> But somehow he did. And I was doing all these things I dreamed about and I was cobbling together a living and then the club was sold and, and I'd fallen in love with Vicky and we wanted to get married and have a family. So then it was like, okay, I'm gonna go to business school and get a normalcy transplant. What a failure, what a terrible, terrible idea. All the people out there who haven't gone to business school, don't go. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> it's, it, was, it was actually good. I did learn a language, 
And then everyone said, oh, you're a creative person. You should go work at advertising. You learned the importance of, of charts and graphs. Though, of charts and graphs, exactly. And I did learn the language of business, but it was a short-lived foray into normalcy. And <laughs> I would say because very... Uh, a short time into my tenure at J. Walter Thompson, the guy who was supposed to be my rabbi, rabbi called me into my, in his office and said, how do you walk, Ed? It's like, I don't know, Jerry. I never really thought about it. People tell me you amble. <laughs> and you know I do amble, you do amble. Right? right? So you yeah. know. And so he said, Sometimes and with ended. not a trace of irony, he goes, you can't amble around here. Clients have to think you know where you're going. <laughs> and I was just like, what? So I came home and I told Vicky, I was like, Jerry Gottlieb told me I need to walk differently. I need to relearn how to walk. <laughs> and so mercifully, I got laid off. The only bad thing was I got laid off. I came home and Vicky had just come back from the doctor and she said, I'm pregnant. <laughs> so I was like, oh, shit, what do I do here? Did you, did you amble really? away? Yeah, exactly. So I was like, that is awesome. That is great. And so for the next two days, I actually put on my suit and grabbed my briefcase and pretended to go to work every day for the next two days until I just could, I couldn't prolong the charade. And so... Uh, that was my attempt at normalcy. And so then I ended up, um, I was writing about music. I was doing all kinds of, still doing all kinds of things in music. And then I was working at another ad agency, slightly better job, but still not fun. And um, I wrote my first book about food, which was called New York Eats, which mm -hmm. was an idiosyncratic non-restaurant guide to non-restaurant food in New York. And all of a sudden, you know, like I became a food person and I didn't, you know, unlike you, I, I you know, I was, I, you know, I'm a decent home cook. I'm a better home cook, thanks to you. But I had lots of opinions. That goes back to Adele Rose. And, and the thing about that book, though, um, is that it was... Um I mean, it was the precursor to food blogs, right? It was, it was, it was yes. strong opinions from somebody who was obsessive. Yes, which is like a for sure. Like food blogs, um, and um, it, it was short. The writing was short. Like each, each description was very short, and it was very specific about what you were supposed to eat. Like, yeah, you don't go to this place for the whole experience. You go to this place for this dish. Right, and then I and then I would say, you know, how, the brownies are awesome. Skip the apple pie, yes. you know. And so that was my contribution to to uh, food literature, <laughs> as as it were. Uh, so there was MFK Fisher, and then there was Ed Levine telling you about <laughs> apple pie. Uh, but um, and so from there, I sort of got assignments from the Times about food and got assignments from Gourmet and had a radio show on the NPR affiliate. I love telling food stories, as you talk about in the forward. Even at Serious Eats, you know, I always tell everyone, it's like the story is paramount in anything you write. And it's one of the reasons why Kenji is just, one of the most awesome food writers on the planet is because he is a great cook, he's a great storyteller, and he sort of takes you on his adventures, and he's not afraid to admit that he, he's gone down a, a dark alley and it didn't turn out right. So, but anyway, so I, I was doing all this work, and then I even had an opportunity to develop a competitor to the Food Network, and at the very last second, this was like in the early 90s, um, it fell through, excuse me, in the, in the early 2000 aughts, it fell through, and that's when I started blogging about food, and what I loved about blogging was the freedom. I, uh, you know, I say in the book, it was like, it was like an emancipation proclamation for it's food man, writers. It's the giving it to the man. What? It's giving yeah, it to the man. Exactly, it was just like, <laughs> I didn't, I, 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 in one fell swoop, what blogging did for me, and I think for many people, is it got rid of all the gatekeepers. 
You know, it's like, I didn't have to pitch my editor at the Times about a story. I didn't have to pitch my editor at Gourmet. I didn't have to pitch a television show. It's like, I could do whatever I wanted. So I was just like, could this really be true? And I, if I, as soon as I hit publish, I was, it was distributed all around the world. And there was just and how, some... But how many people around the world were reading it? Uh, <laughs> You know, you would have to ask that question. <laughs> you know, as Calvin Trillin says about what he was paid for, each, what he's paid for each poem in the nation, it's probably the high two figures. <laughs> it's probably the high two figures initially. But um, eventually, you know, we... Do you remember the day you hit like, like 10,000 pages? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I wrote this piece about uh, eating it per se, uh, and because I, I said, you know, what's the big deal? How good could this be? I said, for the cost of the lunch at per se, I could eat at my favorite hot dog stand on the Upper West Side every day for lunch for three months. <laughs> so I was like, and so what was really hilarious, and this is when I first began to feel the power of the internet, is we I went to lunch. This, you know, we ordered. They bring out the food, and then they you, you bring, blogged it. That morning? Yeah, I blogged it that morning. And I said, could it possibly be worth, you know, whatever it was at the time, $130? And they bring out, they, they have a, what do they call those? Your, uh, what's the, the cloche. cloche? Yeah. So they, they, the cloche reveals a hot dog. It was awesome, you know, like, so someone from, from Thomas Keller's organization had clearly been reading uh, you know, or there was a Google alert, <laughs> and so, and then they, and I all, I had also written like that we had eaten at the French Laundry, and I, I, I thought I didn't really feel like worshiping at the Church of Thomas Keller again, and so then <laughs> the server says, uh, "The chef would like to see you," and I'm like, "Oh <laughs> shit!" and and then all of a sudden, so I go back to the kitchen, and Thomas Keller walks out. He goes, so how's church, Ed? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like, but, that, but it was at that moment that I realized He was people, one of today's 12 page views. <laughs> exactly. And so I think that probably got, you know, 5,000 page views, which felt like a zillion page views, you know, and then... So then I decided, okay, the blogosphere is the future, and there was all this press about the blogosphere being the future of publishing, and I totally drank the Kool-Aid, and I was like, I'm going to build this big business out of food blogs. And so I wrote a business plan, which I say in the book, or by definition, um, semi-fictional. You know, you, you sort of, you, you write them and then you hope and pray that something in them comes true. <laughs> and, um, and then we actually came out here. I was, uh, I met Meg Hurahan, who was the co-founder of Blogger, along with Evan Williams, who now uh, is the founder of Medium and was the co-founder of Twitter. So we have a lot of Bay Area connections. And Meg had, they, uh, Google made its first acquisition of Blogger. So Meg had made a fair amount of money from that sale, and so she was food blogging because she didn't have to make money, but she didn't really tell me that there wasn't any relationship between food blogging and money. <laughs> she forgot to tell me that. So uh, I, I wrote a business plan, and... You know, we came out here, we talked to some VCs, one of them was asleep, uh, <laughs> and then, then his, Actually, his associate said, oh, he just came back from a ski trip to Sun Valley. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, in, and, that, in that original business yeah. plan, um, and I, we've never actually talked about this, um, in the original business plan, um, how, what was your strategy for content generation? So first it was going to be videos because I'd come oh, right, off right, right. of this um, television and project. So you, had, you had a budget built in there. Yes, for and so video Meg video. Hurahan looked at the budget and was like, you know, you have money for a month. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, no, let's do text and photos. And so, but, you know, the business plan... 
you know, we, we tried to raise money for the, you know, a million dollars. My brother invested the first tranche of money, which was this amazing, you know, it was like, I, I thought it was a miracle and, and I, I, you know, really the site wouldn't exist without him and his wife who's here tonight. And, uh, but we still needed more money, but, you know, the business plans would always say, oh, by the year three, we're going to have $40 million in ad sales. And people have to remember that at this point, Facebook was not selling many ads. They only started selling advertising a year before I started blogging, you know, and I say that by the end, so I didn't think of them as a competitor, you know, and when I, when I ended up selling the site in 2015, I think they were selling, you know, like $20 billion worth of advertising. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought, they weren't even in my consideration set for, for competition. And I just had totally drunk the Kool-Aid and I could never admit the sad, sad truth was I was trying to raise money so I could have my dream job, right? right. And the bottom line is nobody's gonna give you money for that. You know, you can't say, if you just write me a check for a million dollars, I'll have the best job I've ever had. <laughs> it does not work that way. So, you know, I was like, so I couldn't say that. So I had to come up with the numbers because people want a return on their investment. Imagine that. They, they not only want their money back, but they want some more money. And so, uh, you know, when, when we started, and that first year or two, even when you started writing for us, it was magic. There was uh, uh, that feeling of walking in to uh, Sirius Eats World Headquarters, which was then on 27th Street, before we moved to Grand Street, and everyone wanted in. You know, like we had judges and lawyers doing unpaid internships at Serious Eats. It was crazy. And, you know, I mean, I, I'd love to know from you, it's like how you felt like when, when I approached you and like, how did you come to write for us? You know, it's like... Oh, I came? Yeah. Oh, um... I, I mean, so when I mean you, when when I first started writing for Serious Seeds was when Adam Kuban. Was, um, was so I was I was working for I, w I had been a cook for a while and then I was working for Cooks Illustrated, um, for for Chris Kimball, um, and I wrote a recipe for a burger and then Adam, who was at the time the uh, managing editor at Serious Seeds, um, and the founder of the of the vertical of of uh, the, the hamburger vertical. Like yeah, hamburger a hamburger today. Yeah, he so he like wrote a blog post about this burger thing that I wrote on um, Cooks Illustrated, um, and so I saw that some someone forwarded it to me and I saw it go up and then I saw there was this like conversation around it, um, and this is well really different from like my my sort of my day to day feedback loop at, at Cooks Illustrated where it's like all right I'm like working on this story for eight months. Right. Um, once it gets published, um, then it like it takes another four months before it gets printed. Then it gets gets to the the audience. They read it, and then it takes them probably like another like two to six months to fill out their survey. And so like a year after, a year and a half, or whatever it is after I started the story, I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I should have tested that <laughs> instead. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, whereas when I wrote the, I wrote a story, and then like Adam posted, it and like a day later, there's like 12 comments. And I was like, oh, like, and and they're all suggesting different things that you could try. Um, I was like, this is pretty cool. Like, that's a pretty cool way to write about recipes. Um, and I and um, I don't remember where that was. 2006, 2007. Yeah, seven, I think it was maybe? 2007. Um, um, and so I, I wasn't really that familiar with like online publications at the time, but that seemed pretty cool. And so then um, I wrote to Adam, and I said I'd want to write a couple stories for him because um um well it was it was mainly because the, at cook's illustrated like i loved the work i was doing where i got to test things and i got like that was i mean it was like a dream job scenario it's like you get paid to do something that you just want to do um um but the part of it i didn't love was that it's like you're um th there's a there's a formula a formula at, at cook's illustrated and there's a 
a sausage grinder built into the editorial process where it's just like words, your words go in here and then like Cook's Illustrated words come out there. Um, <laughs> and so you don't get like too much creative control, um, A, over, over, over like the actual words that you're putting in, um, but more importantly over like the kinds of subjects that you can right. look at. Um, so with a print magazine, it's like you, you, have, a, you have a fixed audience um, and you have to make sure that they stay happy because otherwise they're going to cancel the subscription. Right. Um, and so you have to make sure that like, you know, every article that you put in there is going to resonate with most of them. Um, and so you don't really have much latitude to do like fun, crazy things. Um, whereas on the internet, if you become, you know, it's like on the internet, there's like a, a an entire website that's just about hamburgers. Right. That, that's and then done that by crazy discovered. people like us. Yeah. And then I discovered there's an entire one just about pizza. Um, and so when um, so I wrote a couple times for Adam, and then eventually um, um, my wife was going to grad school, and so we moved back to New York. Right. Um, and I was kind of freelancing for a while. At, right. You were making burritos for oh, yeah, West I was freelancing at Cook's Illustrated still, and then doing um, some private chef stuff. Just and and you and I fun. went out, and I don't even know why I asked you this. I think it was because Adam told me you'd gone to MIT. You know, so I thought, wow, you must be, you must be, and you, and, and, and what you wrote for us was, showed that you were a really great storyteller, and I knew from talking to you and talking to Adam that you really knew how to cook, and so, and I, of course, I didn't, at the time, series season wasn't going to be about recipes, but then I asked you if you'd write a food science column, right? We had lunch, I think yes. we had lunch at at uh, at Trailer Park. Trailer Park, yeah, Burger Place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, we had lunch. I, th I think um, I'd been, yeah, I'd been emailing you a few times because um, I was looking for more permanent freelance work, work. Yeah. writing, permanent freelance work. Um, and so I'd actually met with like a bunch of different um, food site editors, <laughs> um, and um, and the reason your lunch stood out to me was because. Um, <laughs> I don't even want to know that. No, but <laughs> <laughs> um, was because with with most of the other food site editors, it was like um, you were there to talk about your career and your and like the business and the way it was working and all these things you're going to build. Um, and then when I went out to you w to lunch with you, it was like um, I was there nervous about like what I should order on the menu, and then you just ordered like half the menu anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, and so so the difference was. <laughs> The, the, the difference was that, um, well, the reason I wanted to work for you was because when we went out to lunch, it seemed like it was about the food and that you actually cared about what we were doing. And like, um, and whereas with other food site editors and, and magazine editors, um, it seemed more about like them trying to assure me that I was going to have like a career. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want. I I hope that you would have a career. I think it's worked out pretty well for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but so, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I guess yeah. No, you if you can tell me what your um. I, I guess tell me about like your relationship with with money at the time because because oh you had oh um, my god no no well specifically yeah. because because of like that that situation um, where you seemed. I mean, at all times you see more, more, folk. and and if you read the book, it's like you're, you're the the book is is um is a series of meetings, um that, that are mostly about money and the problems that money are causing. But I'm always um, bring good food. Exactly, to exactly, and and but but every meeting is about the the food that you're bringing to it. And why <laughs> that you, was the problem. Why That's why people that weren't giving food. me money. <laughs> okay, so talk to me. Yeah, so I guess talk about your yeah. So I mean, money. it was. It, you know, it was, I was slaloming between the gates were, one gate was about food and the fact that I was getting to do what I loved and that I discovered that I, also that what I really loved was discovering people like you and giving you the runway and watching you take flight it was really great. But, and that people, you know, Series Heats became the next big thing. So then I was like, the money's definitely going to follow you know and then the money didn't follow and I just could never understand why and maybe it's because we weren't making any money I, I don't know <laughs> that's probably it and but I I thought that was a mere detail <laughs> and 
And so I would, you know, I'd always be on the prowl for money and we never had enough money in the bank and, and advertisers took forever to pay because what leverage did, did we have, right. right? So if American Express took six months to pay, they took yeah, six you months can't to just pay. Say, There's oh, nothing, we don't need you, man. Yeah, we don't need your money, man. Sorry, American <laughs> Express. Couldn't do that. And, so, and I, you know, this also harkens back to Adele Road. You know, I think my entire family has a very ambivalent view about money. And so I thought that the money would just flow. Again, so I could have my dream job, so you could have your dream job, so everyone could have their dream job. And yet, we never, ever were self-sustaining. And so I was always looking for money. And a friend of mine said, you have more friends in friends and family financing than anyone else I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and that's what would happen. I would talk to friends and friends of friends and family members. And my brother and his wife kept putting in more money until they said, no mas. And everyone said at, at the end, no mas. And so, so I kept borrowing money. And this is the problem. You know, it's like you convinced yourself that, and maybe this is where the optimism comes in. It's like we are, success is right around the corner. You know, I was Sisyphus. That boulder was right at the top of the hill. We were like three feet from the summit. And so I would convince myself that that was what was going on. And then the goddamn boulder would go back down the hill. And so, and I would go and, and borrow money and I, and I would tell my wife, okay, this is temporary, you know, and then I would have to borrow more money and I would have to borrow more money and I would... And this is over the course of like how many Yeah, it's many, like course years? of five years and it got to a really crazy number and so I was never I, paying I it when, back. When we were... Um, um, I mean, I, I was obviously... Every, I think everybody who worked at Serious States knew money was tight, especially when we were freelancers. Right. Um, <laughs> um, I was paying you $30 a story. What more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> um, but so the joke we had at the office is that we could always tell like how, <laughs> how overdrawn the serious seats bank account by how it was, by how high your shoulders were that day. <laughs> when you walked my wife, well, my wife would say, I could tell by the way you put the key in the door. It was the same <laughs> thing. So, but you, but so I, you know, so for me, well, a lot of reading the book for me was actually kind of like, um, watching like a prequel movie because, or not even a prequel, but like a movie that if they had made, they should do this in one of the cinematic universes was, is like make a movie from this person's perspective and then from that person's yeah, yeah, perspective. Yeah, yeah. But it was interesting to see like, oh, like this was that period when Ed's shoulders were like, it's pretty low. <laughs> yeah. And hearing it from your side. But, um, can you tell me about, um with the financially and I get, well, and I, and I don't know if this ties directly to as hard as far as like how you, you felt at the time, but like, um, financially and, and, um, psychologically, psychologically, yeah. what your lowest point was. God, you know, uh, I remember it all too vividly. Uh, I had to go to Vicky one last time to up the line of credit I don't even want to say it because it's too upsetting, but it, I was literally betting the ranch. Uh, and Vicky was furious and she did this and then she just said, but I'm done. You know, I'm totally done. And I said, okay, and if the business doesn't turn around, I will start to sell it. I will begin the process. And it had almost been sold a zillion times, if any of you have read the book. And so at the end of 2014, when we owed a lot of money to the bank uh, that was personally guaranteed because one of the secrets of, that a lot of people don't know is as a small business person, that, and small business is defined by anything less than $50 million in sales, you cannot borrow money without personally guaranteeing it. And so it was the end of 2014, and I, look, 
I love my wife to pieces. And I, I just, I knew that this was it, you know, and, and it didn't turn around. And so I had to um, start seriously looking for a buyer. And so that was really the lowest point because not, I, I couldn't put my wife through this. I couldn't put my friends who had invested money. And I also, I felt like, my crew, you guys were like my family, you know? It was like I did try to recreate the family that had been taken away from me. And so I didn't want to let you down. Like I, I wanted you to have jobs and I wanted you to go on to have the careers that you deserve to have, you know? And it's one of the great things about Serious Eats is that so many of you have gone on to have amazing careers and that was the greatest and most unexpected source of pleasure and satisfaction from the whole thing. But so that was at stake you too. You said you would just use this and, and dump us. Yeah, exactly. Well, there was that aspect <laughs> too. But, um, but so that everything seemed to be coming to a head at the end of 2014. The amount of money we owed to the bank that we weren't paying back, the fact that the business wasn't turning around. Also, I recognized that it was not going to get easier with Facebook and Google, and now Amazon, competing for the same advertising dollars, and they have the ability to scale and target in a way that we don't. Mm -hmm. So I sort of, at that point, I, I had no choice. Even I had run out of resilience, you know, like I, it was just time. And then how did, you, how did you turn it around? And so, you know, I put it up, for sale and a, a bunch of people uh, uh, offered to buy serious seats and uh, and then I was all set to take one offer. They weren't offering much in the way, they were all offering to pay my debts, uh, but they all of the employee equity would have been wiped out. And employees own 20% of the business at the end. And you own, you know, a fair number of shares. And so I really hated that, but I was sort of, I was resigned to accepting it. And then the people that bought us, Fexi Media came along and actually recognized why Serious Eats was so special. And they thought, because they were business people first, that if they could just let me and my crew concentrate on the creative side of the business, they would take care of the business side of the business. And I was like, this sounds like a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's, that's sort of how it happened. And that was in 2015. And, and uh, they've been awesome stewards yeah. of the business. And you've, you know, you're, you've got on to be you know, to amazing heights, you know, people always ask me, like, are you jealous about Kenji's success? And it's like, no, Kenji's like a son of mine who got bar mitzvahed. You know, <laughs> you know it's like, I was just incredibly proud of you. And I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who came out of serious. Yeah, you know, and it, it's it's been great because with the publication of the book, there's been a lot of... Uh, chatter on Twitter and also like New York Magazine's website, they did an oral history of the early days of Serious Eats and then there have been a lot of Twitter conversations about all the people that came out of Serious Eats and, uh, and that, as I say, was just such a, a blessing for me to watch all of you take flight and the fact that if I played some small role in exposing your talents to the world, then uh, I will have succeeded in a way that I never could have imagined succeeding. You know, so uh, it, it it was a you know it's it was a crazy crazy roller coaster ride. Let's face it, it really was. You were there, you know all the ups and downs and you were i think you say in the forward that it that the book reads like a work of fiction because uh it does it and yet and it's, it, that's only partially true <laughs> exactly that's only partially true no but it's it's um 
it's, it, it's a great thing when you can do what you dreamed about doing and, and you can make good on the, on the world's promise that, that it is pregnant with possibility. Mm-hmm. You know, and, th- and that's what Serious Seats was for me. It was a, a manifestation of that, you know, that the world can be pregnant with possibility. Yeah, so, you know, I, there are so many things that I am grateful for. Uh, there were a lot of painful moments. <laughs> you lived through them, mm-hmm. but I, I, I don't know. I, it, it sounds crazy, but I'm not sure I would change any of it. I'm not sure there would have been. What about, any... I mean, what about like fam, like family-wise, how it affected? You know, um, it's you it's were... one of these things where I that was really hard. Like even after the sale, I I said, um, you know, I have a lot to make right to my brother and his wife and to my wife, and, uh, and, and really even to both of them, to all of them, you know, it's like I owed so much to them. And I think when you're, you're engaged in this desperate struggle for survival, you sort of develop a kind of myopia that means that you're not really cognizant of, of the way that your actions affect other people. You know, I talk about in business school, they teach you about the relationship between risk and reward. But they, what they don't teach you is the relationship between risk and reward in a psychological and emotional way. And I realized I had risked and jeopardized so much in that nine year roller coaster, you know, and, and, you know, there's this passage in the book that, that, uh, that I think sort of explains it, um, better than I could do here. So if you'll Mm -hmm. let me, uh, read this and, uh, it's, it, it says a lot, um, and um, where is it? Here it is. Um, okay. Just while yeah. you're looking for it. Um, yeah. We are, I think we're down to a few minutes. Oh, okay. But, um, but so if, if there are people who want to ask questions, um, you can line up for yeah. uh, the microphone. Uh, I think back there. Is that right? Back there? Yeah. Uh, so this will just take a minute. Do we have a minute? Yeah, yeah go for yeah. it. Yeah. So... Um, with the, with the deal really done, I had to take stock of the collateral damage Sirius Eats had done to my relationships with both Vicky and Mike. The fight to keep Sirius Eats alive had been a grueling nine-year battle. And like most battles, it had left some wounds that still hadn't healed. I mistakenly thought at the time that the proceeds of the sale would wipe away all of Vicky's conflicted feelings about the whole Sirius Eats saga. The rewards were worth the risks, weren't they? But I couldn't wipe the slate clean. Why? Because... When I learned about the relationship between risk and reward in business, no teacher at Columbia Business School spoke to the collateral emotional and psychological damage associated with the risks you take to reap the rewards. That damage, it turns out, is really difficult to repair. Vicky thought I didn't give credit where credit was due. She was wrong, maybe one of the only things she's been wrong about in 35 years of marriage. It was true that I couldn't entirely admit how instrumental she'd been And it's true that I was too dumb to really give credit where it was due, but it's also true that I literally can't imagine what it would have been like to do this without her, and I am keenly aware that it wouldn't have worked if she hadn't been on my side. In fact, the most harrowing details I've had to relive in writing this book have nothing to do with financial security, only the terrifying knowledge of how close I came to doing real damage to the relationship that made it all possible. For the nine long years it took to get serious heats off the ground, in fact, long before that and after, I relied every single day on Vicky's solid judgment, her business savvy, her good counsel, her sense of humor, and her preternatural calm. Her unwavering belief in me was and is humbling. I do not for a moment downplay the difficulty of of the situations I put her in or the tremendous sacrifice she had to make. Which isn't to say that I uh, I was any good at communicating any of this at the time. (laughs) 
So we kept fighting. More than a year after I sold the business, we had yet another argument that ended without a resolution, neither of us giving an inch. I got on my bike and I rode to Tiffany. I'd never been inside Tiffany, so I had no idea what to do when I went through the revolving doors. I asked the person stationed right inside the door where I could buy pearl earrings for my wife. Vicky had been talking about how much she wanted a pair of pearl earrings for years, even before Sirius Eats. A kindly saleswoman showed me a variety of diamond and pearl earrings. I picked a pair out for Vicky. It's not a bad metaphor, a piece of grit in an oyster shell, a lot of work to make something that looks so effortlessly beautiful. She opened the box like a kid opening a present on Christmas morning. Vicky grinned from earring to earring as she walked over to a mirror to try them on. I almost started to cry, mostly out of frustration at myself. Why had it taken me so long to get to this place I obviously needed to be? Pride, stupidity, stubbornness? No matter, I made it. Let the healing begin. It continues to this day. So, there you have it. <laughs> you don't even have to read the book now. <laughs> Uh, um, if there if there are questions, um, there is an open microphone in the back of the room. We have one on Twitter right now. While folks think of questions to come line up, um, are there any up and coming food writers we should be keeping an eye on? You know, <clears throat> I that's a really good question. I there is this woman. Um, I think there's this woman actually at Grub Street. I think is really good named Nikita Richardson. Uh, there's also, uh, and now I'm blanking on her name, and Max Falkowitz, I think, is, is a great food writer that started at Serious Eats that is now doing amazing work for Serious Eats, but many other uh, writers, I mean, many other publications. Uh, and I think there are a lot of good young food writers um, that are coming up. It's one of the good things about the web is that there. Video people count, you think? Yeah, and yeah, um, Andrew, Ray. Andrew Ray binging Andrew with Babbage. I don't know if any of you uh, watch. Uh, he's he was a video special effects supervisor who taught himself to cook by reading uh, Serious Eats and specifically Kenji's columns, and now he's like a YouTube star. Like binging with Babbage gets like three has three million subscribe four million subscribers. Many, uh, many millions. Yeah, many, many millions. And uh, yeah, there are all kinds of people. Alex and she's always guy, emailing. Alex the French what? guy also. There's a, guy, there's a YouTube channel called French Guy Cooking. Yeah. Alex the and French what about that Chinese? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. There's a, the, uh, the one I sent you. The yeah, the one yeah, you sent a, me. Um, oh, his name is... I don't it's want to, I, one I don't of them is American, uh, one, the other one, is Chinese, right? Oh, oh, the, oh, that, that one. one. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's one in English called Chinese Cooking Dude Mystified, yeah. but there's another YouTube channel of a of a chef at a restaurant in um, in Sichuan who does videos that are really, really. Good. They're they're all in Chinese. But, uh, in uh, what do they speak in Sichuan? Which one do they speak? Cantonese. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Anyhow, yeah. um, but it, but it, but it's subtitled in English if if you don't speak it, um, like I don't, um, and and they're great videos. <laughs> cool. Great. Where are you two eating for dinner tonight? <laughs> well, that's you know that can be an hour long discussion sometimes, <laughs> um, and uh, we actually talked about maybe eating one dish at the bar because that's all we could afford at the Angler next door. <laughs> Uh, which is supposed to be his casual restaurant, but yeah. I looked at the prices, they didn't seem so casual to me. I don't know. Um, so, uh, I'm but. I'm gonna come back down to San Mateo. San Mateo, so Karaoke, yeah. Karaoke and really good fish and chips at the Swing and Door. Yeah, by the way. Worst, well, right, worst tall, sure. Worst tall, we're, 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 we're gonna do some, um, a couple of small events on Saturday, which we're really excited about. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that because I've never eaten at Worstall, so which is pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, what else? Uh, where else have I eaten? Uh, oh, I told you about that torta place I really liked. Uh, uh, Gordo. Torta Gordo. La Torta Gordo? Yeah, I think it's called La Torta Gordo in the Mission. 
And I had some ice cream. You know, I usually have, when I'm in San Francisco or Los Angeles, there's usually two or three stops involved in lunch. <laughs> but that's because Vicky's not with me. Because <laughs> she would limit me to one. But um, yeah, so any other questions? I have a question. Um, so I read a lot of you know technical food blogs, Chef Steps, ATK, and Serious Eats, obviously. A lot of the recipes seem sort of occasionally eerily similar. And I'm curious how you, you know, Kenji and Ed react to recipes that, you know, maybe seem like they ripped off an idea that you had or some work that you did or something like that. Maybe <laughs> Ed, Are you we... asking the right dude to my left? <laughs> yeah. I also imagine Ed maybe... He has rather strong opinions about this. <laughs> and I, I also imagine maybe you've had to had some writers who said like, boss, look what happened. And maybe you've had to talk them down or something like that. So I'd be curious to know about that. <laughs> well, you know, um, that used to happen <laughs> when he was... So when he was when when he was my employee, Kenji would sometimes get furious at when someone stole his recipe or took credit for a recipe, and I remember. And I guess he should remain nameless. Uh, but someone wrote something in the New York Times magazine about another <laughs> another uh, editor of a food magazine and who took credit for Kenji's vodka pie crust. Oh, Kenji, since giving credit back. But. Yeah. <laughs> he then corrected the record, by the way. So I guess we can name him. It was Chris Kimball. <laughs> uh, you've all heard of him. But Kenji was rather annoyed. And that's putting it mildly. Uh, so the reason I was annoyed was because <laughs> at the time, at the time, um, so when I, was, when I started writing the Food Lab for the column for Ed um, and then started writing the book for Ed's wife, um, um, Cooks Illustrated, um, they wanted to buy the rights to the book to, to publish it. Um, and this was just after I had, um, this, was, this was while I was still freelancing for them actually. Um, and um, they offered me not a lot, like very, 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 very little. Oh, right. Um, and he was like, that's all you're going to get for it anyway. And it, yeah, it was no royalties. It was a flat yeah. fee. It was like, but look, we'll even put your put your name as the author. That was their <laughs> that was their incentive. <laughs> well, that was um, a big deal because Cook's Illustrated books only had Chris's name, right? On the either Chris's name or from nothing. the editorial team. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and so Ed's wife Vicky had advised me to say no, and I also felt like saying no, um, and so I did. And then and then. Um, and so for a, a while, I had a bad relationship with Cooks Illustrated because then I sold my b book rights to someone else, and then they sent a um, like a, uh, their letter. Their lawyer sent a letter to us, um, like a semi cease and desist letter, right? Yeah, or, saying here are the specific subjects you've written about for Cooks Illustrated, so you cannot write about them for your book. Um, and um, and yes, yeah, so so relationships with Chris weren't great at the time, and then. Right in the middle of that, he, yeah, he had a he had a an interview in New York Magazine. It was a New York Times Magazine. New York Times Magazine, yeah, where where he um, he said that he came up with this idea for this uh, recipe that I came up with the idea. For. <laughs> um, but everything's all good. Everything's fine. Yeah, and now. all good. Not in fact, Chris time. is doing <laughs> the event with me in Boston, so we're all good. <laughs> and <laughs> anyhow, uh, to get back to the question. Um, <laughs> Um, in, in general, um, so in general, like among the big sites, like most of us know each other and are friends and it's like, it's generally understood that like if, especially these days that like if you publish an idea that came from someone else and like you forget to credit them, just like say, hey, you forgot to credit this. And most people will be like, oh, oops, you're right. Like it's an accident. Um, the, and then, um, and, and then generally, you know, I, I, like I think it's sort of the don't punch down rule. It's like. It's like if, if somebody who has like a little food blog is just starting out, it's like I was there at some point. It's like I know what it's, I know right. it's like having a food blog and like, um, you know, not that Serious Eats like took ideas from places without crediting them, but, but it's very easy to like overlook that stuff um, and, 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 and overlook the crediting bit when you're like doing research from like many different places. So it's like um, if they do it, then it's like it's okay. But then if someone like, 
you know, if if it's like Tasty or like Tyler Florence or someone like that. <laughs> Not to mention it's like, names. Come on, you should know. You should know better than this. Um, and then in those situations, it's usually like you 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 give the, you ask them first nicely, and if they don't, then you then well then I publicly shame them. But <laughs> <laughs> and when he when he was working for me, he was like. He'd write me these emails, or he'd call me, and he'd say, this mother stole this recipe. What should I do? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> you are to do nothing for the time being. We will yeah. deal with this. And that, that was when I didn't write you emails saying, oh, by the way, Ed, like, David Chang's not going to talk to you for the next eight weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. There are many people that stop talking to us. No. Uh, but, yeah. I hope we've answered your question. This is our last audience question. Yeah. Ed, you've always had a really interesting take on food and how to communicate it, but the book shows that you have an perhaps even more interesting take on life and how to communicate that. What are you going to do with that talent going forward? What's your next writing project or your next communications project? You know, it's, it's an interesting thing because... Um, I remember a few years ago, after we sold Serious Seats, we were at the engagement party of, a, of, of an editor at Serious Seats who actually lives in San Francisco, Carrie Jones, and her father, who is, I think, a VC uh, in the Valley. Uh, as we were leaving, he said, hey, Ed, let me know when you want to start a new business. I'll invest. And Vicky turned to him and said, he's not starting another business. <laughs> so, so, so I don't think that's in the cards. But I think I, what writing this book, you know, I, I never considered myself a writer. I always used to say I'm someone who writes. But I think for the first time since I wrote this book, which was a lot of hard work, and I had a lot of help from some amazingly talented people in terms of giving me notes and, and just forcing me back into the story, I, I think I might want to write another book. You know, I, 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 uh, I, It won't be another memoir, but I think I have a lot to say based on, as you say, I mean... I have a philosophy of life that stood me in good stead in terms of, you know, having the greatest wife you could imagine and a son that we love to pieces and that's living his dreams and my wife is living her dream as, a, as Kenji's literary agent and, and other people that are in this room. Um, and if I can figure out a way to communicate that, you know, beyond the sort of trite, you know, uh, live out your passions, live out your dreams, because I know that the flip side to that. And, uh, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do it, you know. And, and so I'm hoping to, to write more. And I'm still running Serious Eats, and it's still something I'm incredibly proud of. And we're still doing great stuff. And the new owners have been really fantastic and so everybody keep logging on to serious seats because it's <laughs> it's still a source of great pleasure and satisfaction to me so what about you kenji man what's 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 you know like <laughs> what's up with you i think Not... i'm supposed to ask you a last oh last okay question. i don't know uh, oh <laughs> all right yeah we have to yeah, go, yeah. Right? I, I mean that's all i've wanted to do oh okay ask you this last question um which is a informed tradition what is your 60-second idea to change the world? Oh, God. My 60-second idea for cha to change the world. I think it's kind of based on a, a conversation I had with my niece, who's, who's here in the audience. 47 seconds. When I was... <laughs> <laughs> I, it's that people listen to one another. I was telling her about some situation that I felt like I didn't react well, and she said you know, you're a Levine, and so you think you're supposed to immediately have a point of view, but you can also just listen, and that that's something to do. And I think in the world, if more of us just listen to one another without passing judgment, uh, you know, that the world would be a better place. What about you, man? 
Um, 